welcome to the third planet party in our chart party series. Um, we are going to do Mercury today, and I am very excited about it. So let's get going. Got to start off with some disclaimers and expectations. A lot of you are not new to this, but it doesn't matter. It's worth uh, mentioning it every time. And here at these events, we are honest. We respect privacy. We value consent. We are tactful. We credit our references. We are scholars and we plan to synthesize. Um, a big one about that is when we're dialing down on Mercury, one planet, one placement, but we remember that the chart is to be interpreted as a whole. And we keep that in mind. Uh, we use the chat to communicate and we remember our lenses. That's another way of saying, don't take things personally, which I never understood. I was like, how else am I gonna take it? I'm a person. <sighs> it means like, remember the lens through which you're looking, including like how you're feeling today, right? Because that'll affect, <laughs> it'll affect how you interpret things, your mercury. Um, we also understand that trauma may surface. Astrology is a lot deeper than we give it credit for often. So we hold space for that and we are considerate and careful about how we talk about things because of that. Just, we understand and recognize that there's a, uh, stuff going on in the room that we don't necessarily need or want to share about but it's there um and then we also consider additional one-on-one -on -one support and one way to do that is with me an astrological consultation but there's all sorts of other one-on-one -on -one support including body work other sorts of divinations um your regular uh non-magical therapy and those kinds of healing modalities are also um, things to consider after we drudge up some of the things to talk about with those other practitioners, right? Um, and then we also know this is not a diagnosis and this is not licensed therapy. This is especially important for this chart party and the next one, which is for the moon, because we're going to be talking about the mind. We're going to be talking about um, terms that have been um, used by the mainstream psychological um, practitioners and as such terms that are very specific. Uh, to the what they call the DSM-5, the Diagnostic, I think it's Standards Manual. It's this big old book that the licensed therapists and diagnosticians use to um, measure people's issues against and say whether they have this disorder or not. Uh, we remember that what we're doing here is not that, not only because that's a very specific thing, but also because that's harmful. That's telling you you got a problem. I'm not doing that. I'm telling you you're a star. I'm just telling you how to shine a little bit brighter and dust yourself off a little bit. All right. So moving on. Shout outs. Shout outs to the ancestors. Always. Thank you. Mm -mm -mm. Mine, yours, all of ours. Shout them out. Shout out to the astrologers. All of you. All of them. Shout out to the stars and planets and numbers. Like we wouldn't be doing this without them. Ancient Babylon and ancient Kemet are the... Uh, cultures from which I am most closely oriented um, from where this comes from, but there are a lot of other ancient uh, knowledge systems to shout out and um, indigenous knowledge systems that um, contributed to this body of knowledge, but are not as uh, acknowledged, if you will. And then also shout out to the mercurial deities and uh, correspondences. And shout out to the creator. Yes. Hi, Kobe. And shout out to you. And speaking of mercurial de deities and correspondences, um, shout out to L.A. Bois. Anyway, y'all know who I am, but I will reintroduce myself again. Noella Sartine, astrologer, homemaker, PhD candidate. I do the individual consultations. I do kids charts. These are my uh, links there we go, uh, to get um, in touch with me and whatnot. And I like to say, work those planets. Don't let them work you because um, shit, you don't have to take it. I mean, karmically low key, low key, but you don't have to like do nothing. And thank you all so much for your uh, congratulatory remarks. And without further ado, thank you for letting me amble on into it. But here we are. We're going to get through this part relatively quickly because I want to get to the cool part. So, Mercury, 
there is a lot of astronomical things we can get into in terms of how it moves, what it does, and all these things. But these are the things I think are most relevant. It takes about 88 days for Mercury to go around the sun. Besides the moon, it's our fastest moving planet. And it has what they call the most eccentric orbit, meaning it's the most elliptical, the most far off from a perfect circle. All of the other planets orbit the sun in more of a circular motion than Mercury. Mercury's out there just like swinging like an oval <laughs> really fast. Like, wah, 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 wah. And the other planets are like, do, 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 do. And Mercury's like, wah, 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 wah. Um, and it has what's called apparent retrograde motion three to four times a year. And I thought this might be a good time to talk about the science, astronomy, physicality, if you will, of the Mercury retrograde. So many of you are familiar with this, but allow me anyway. So um, when Mercury uh, stations retrograde, it looks like it's moving backwards from our point of view on Earth. We can get into the astronomy of, no, you can get into the astronomy of all that with another uh, teacher. Um, but for astrological purposes, meaning like, what does it mean in your chart? It means that it's moving forward degrees, it stops, and then it goes back degrees, it stops, and then it moves forward degrees, right? So it works those areas of your chart back and forth. This is the same exact thing that happens with all the other planets when they go retrograde. It is only really Mercury and then to some extent Mars and Venus that have retrograde periods that affect what happens on Earth in a way that all of us can really tell. Um, one explanation of Mercury retrograde that I like to think about is that it's time to sit down and think about your next move. It doesn't mean that, that you can't make any moves that don't do this, don't do that. Like, it means like, don't be surprised if you don't have all your mental faculties to do all the things at the, at the moment, but you're thinking about it. You're like, damn, I know I got to go back to school. I know I got to move houses. I know I got to um, do something about my relationship, like whatever area of life you're working on, but it's not time. It's not time to do it's time to think, right? Which is like taking in and putting out um, information. Hi, I'm learning. Um, so yeah, that's one way to think about what the retrograde period is without thinking a big list of should I do this or should I do that, right? In general, because Mercury rules over things like transportation and communication, anything related to those things is going to be threatened it at that time. And what I mean threatened is like, it's not going to go exactly as planned. And there's plenty of um, examples of that, such as like missing flights or like uh, uh, you are relying on your phone for like your boarding pass or you're like, you're relying on your, um, your some kind of technology for the information. Like, oh, I'll just look it up when I get there. And then there's no Wi-Fi or like, you can't get in, log into your email on that particular day. The website's down, like really freaky deaky, like one off, like it, so random, so random that this happened. And really you think about Mercury and we'll get into the mythology of Mercury, but think about Mercury, the trickster. It's not like, it's like a banana peel. It's supposed to be funny. <laughs> it's supposed to be funny. So if Mercury, if something happens during Mercury retrograde that trips you up so bad that you're like, oh my God, my life is over. Like I would posit to say that it's not Mercury retrograde, it's you. Because you as a stable individual, a flexible individual should be able to handle whatever Mercury throws your way because it's low key, not that serious, right? Like, oh, you missed your flight. Oh, like your car couldn't get to where you could get. Now, if you're in a situation where like, my car couldn't get to where I get. And that was like the last chance to make the money to do the thing. Then like, see, that's you. Like you are in a dire situation. That's not Mercury retrograde, right? So just things to think about when we're blaming certain planets for like shit that's going on. Like, is it Mercury retrograde? Or are you just like moving too fast? Sit down. <laughs> that ass is too fast. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm not done, but I'm done with that. <laughs> All right, let's go on to the mythology. Let's sit on down. 
So here are some other names for Mercury. You know, when we speak the word Mercury, we are speaking the Roman God. We are doing the European thing, but it doesn't have to be that way, right? There's all sorts of other um, names for Mercury. All the cultures look at the sky. So you just got to ask like, where am I from? And what did they call it? Right. So I just picked out some um, ones that I thought would be interesting to look at. I do want to take this time to talk about Hermes Trismegistus. Okay. So in the Venus party, we talked about our current understanding of Venus as part of the syncretism between Isis, the Egyptian Kemetic goddess, and um, the Roman goddess Venus and the Greek goddess Aphrodite. Mm, I would also like to add that some scholars say that it's Hathor, not Isis, and I, I, ju I just have to add that. We're not going to touch that, but just have to add that. Anyway, anyway, anyway. This syncretism is between the Egyptian Kemetic god Toth, or Tehuti is how you would say it in, I don't know how to say the language because it's not English. Um, that, that god, the god of knowledge, and essentially the, the god, the one that gave us the emerald tablets, yes, that one, and the Greek god Hermes, and the Roman Latin god Mercury. And then, so when they say syncretism, they mean all these things got blended together. And if you don't know anything about history, you'd be like, cool, blending is fun. I like smoothies. But if you know about history, then you would think, oh, syncretism. That means that people had to hide stuff. That means there was probably some violence. That means there was probably some, this is what you believe in now. And the people who were like, but I've always believed in that. were like, okay, I'm going to hide that in this so that you see me doing this, but I'm really doing that. Okay. So, and, it, and this is syncretism is what we talk about with the saints, the Catholic saints and the Yoruba uh, pantheon of deities, the Orisha. Okay. So how do we hide? Shango into Santa Baga, right? We hide. So like the Catholics see us say, oh, Santa Baga. But in, in real life, it's Shango, okay? Think about this same kind of vibe going on in the Hellenistic period. I put it in quotes because again, Hellenistic, you'd be like, that sounds so nice, Helen, how lovely. More like a time of colonization and conquer where information was being reattributed to different sources and hidden in different ways. The entire concept of the occult, what is hidden, comes from these moments of syncretization, okay? So that in mind, think about anytime you hear anything about hermetic or the hermetic lots or the hermeticus, the hermetic corpus, or these are all of our Hellenistic hermetic sources. Oh, are they? And where did they come from? Yenes Hermes, eh? Who, 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 who is it? Originally, who it is is Toth, okay? Toth had all the teachings, had all the attributed, all the knowledge, everything that everybody knew came through this source, okay? And then the colonizers came and said, oh, it was Hermes Trismegistus. And what does Trismegistus mean? It means thrice great, okay? So it's like Hermes so great, Hermes so great, Hermes so great, but it also means Hermes, Toth, Mercury all together. And it also means the name of the source that we're going to call everything that we can't call the melanated knowledge that it really comes from. It's not Lionsgate yet, but you know what I'm talking about. And if you don't, scroll on back through my shit on Instagram and get to eight days of Lionsgate from last year because it, there's hours of footage. Uh, explaining all of this. And there is a uh, big list of references, books, podcasts, all sorts of things. You're like, what do you mean? How do you know this? What do you mean? I got, I got the book list. Okay. I, I could show you the sources from, from whence I learned. And then also I would ask you to read between the lines and do your own research because some, that's how you figure out some of this stuff too. Right. So when we're talking mercurial magic we're talking um hermetic the people who are like really into um hermetic the hermetic corpus um the the madame blavatsky the rosicrucian the 
uh, Order of the Golden Cross, the I'm a group of European descended people using the teachings of Hermes to um, spiritually and culturally bypass the restrictions of my time, all of that. That all comes from um, ancient Kenya, right? I didn't know I was like low key mad about that. Low key, low key. But in any event, I also wanted to point out that the word in Sanskrit for Mercury is Buddha. And some scholars say that it is the same Buddha who started Buddhism, like that Buddha, right? So there is there is another connection between the ancient, ancient teachings and how they spread um, east and west, right? Um, so let's see. Kobe says, syncretism feels double-sided to me because it means the presence of erasure, but also a veil of safety, gatekeeping, gatekeeping, excuse me, if you know, you know, energy. I recently learned to just say that instead of yuck, 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 but I, I always want to say it. Anyway, yes, there, that is an excellent point to make that on the one hand, we can say like, oh, these colonizers came in and took all of our knowledge. But another thing that we can say is our ancestors um, hit it, right? And you just got to go find it. No, it's not easy. It's not easy. And it's also um, not something you can ever, mm, it's not something you can easily feel sure of the way that uh, statistics make you feel sure, like 100%. Like, no, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's a process. And I, uh, Thank you all for being part of mine. All right. Also, I also learned that Mercury is connected to the day Wednesday um, for people in the Vedas, like the Hindu system, in the Germanic system, and the Greco-Roman system. So it's kind of like a worldwide thing that Mercury is, uh, Wednesday is Mercury Day, which I thought was uh, remarkable. And Erica says, I'm a Mercury baby. Yes, I would, I'm looking forward to see how that works out in the chart as well. Okay, so one thing I wanted to point out, this book is Shamanic Egyptian Astrology. And while I'm not a thousand percent on the um, source that it comes from, I do think it brings up interesting ways to look at the astrology from a different way. So for example, they say that um, in traditional astrology, Mercury describes how we communicate, articulate ideas, remember and express ourselves, how the messages of our ego are carried into our conscious experience. Oh yeah, we've, we remember that, we've heard that, right? They say in shamanic Egyptian astrology, Toth represents how effectively we function as a channel of spirit. So to, like we say, oh, what's shamanic Egyptian astrology? How about we look at it at this? For people who are practicing melanated indigenous spiritual lifestyles, your mercury placement represents how effectively you function as a channel of spirit. Shout out to that typo. I see you. I see you. I acknowledge you and I'll fix you in post. All right. So I think it's interesting to think about how um, what you say is always supposed to be related to the divine, right? What you say and what you think. And if you get very far in your spiritual studies, you will notice that um, cleanliness of communication, including what comes in and what goes out, is paramount and across, across the board, right? So I like this reframing too. I do as well. Okay, so now we're going to get into some of the um, astrology, right? Like the, <laughs> I was just putting on my, my feather cap there, like, doo -doo 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 -doo. side note, y'all, um, I have been diving into um, lots, uh, you know, we've been talking about the lots, and it has pushed me towards studying medieval astrology. How come I didn't put two and two together, that medieval astrology is astrology by black people by by arab people by moorish people how come it has not been explained to me that there's a whole nother written legacy of people who look like me how come i had to find that out myself yeah really okay let's talk about it for a second and this is because of my whack-ass understanding of european history when you say medieval, I actually think Renaissance. You say medieval, and I think William Lilly, because that's 1600s. I'm like, oh, yeah, medieval. They're like, dun, 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 dun. Mm. medieval. They're like, oi, 
<laughs> I was gonna talk about some diseases. No, they're not doing shit. But all of the movies made it seem like they were. <sighs> Y'all remember Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and how Robin Hood's best friend was Morgan Freeman? That was a moor. That was a Moorish black man. They were telling it in my face, and I didn't understand. Y'all, I've been putting two and two together and making four for weeks now. <laughs> and every time what I realize is, oh, even more claims to fame for why people who are melanated are the ones who are the keepers of the astrological knowledge. Oh, yeah, bet. No problem. I, I got you. It is becoming clear. Um, and yeah yeah more 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 sources to um to come forth you know i'm I'm, make, I'm making a list so and shout out to everyone who's coming in hello, hello, hello. i'm so happy to see you anyway back to this why is this important why is what i'm talking about important because right now when you do astrology there is a lot of talk about traditional astrology and what is traditional astrology it is the astrology that comes from the um most ancient texts what are the most ancient texts? They are basically transcriptions of the mystery books from the pyramids and the temples of ancient Egypt. Who did the transcribing? The Greeks and the Romans, essentially, and the people of um, Alexandria, which was what they call the height, the capital of like the Hellenistic area, and it was the place where everybody was mixed together. Hmm. So when you see someone saying like, oh, but these are the rules of traditional astrology, then you can say, well, where does that come from? It comes from people that look like me, right? Like, and if it comes from people that look more European, it's because those are the ones who were copying the notes, not because they're the ones that came up with it. And I'm not saying the original people came up with it anyway, because the further we dig back, it seems like it was delivered by an even more ancient more extraterrestrial source but that may be for the neptune party anyway 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 this is, these are the rules these are the rules okay um when we talk about planetary condition there's first off there's five thousand more rules um but these are the big ones mercury is the ruler of gemini and virgo so if you have any of these in here um you have what we call mercury domicile mercury is in detriment in sagittarius and pisces so if you have mercury in sagittarius or pisces you have what's called mercury in detriment mercury is exalted at virgo at the 15th degree specifically if you want to know why it's the degrees please read the second i think the second appendix of kenneth bowser's introduction to western sidereal astrology he explains um, where those degrees came from and how it's related to the Thema Mundi and um, the Sumerian Babylonian astrologers who figured out uh, why these are the best degrees and also why it's tied to the sidereal zodiac, not the tropical. But in anyway, anyway, anyway. Oh, yeah, because all these rules were, were derived before the tropical zodiac even existed. So that's why they apply to your sidereal chart. In any event, uh, Mercury has its fall in Pisces because it's exalted in Virgo, and it has its joy in the first house. So let's take a look at what all of that means, right? Um, if a planet is in domicile, I like to say it's doing the most, okay? Some people think like, oh, that's good. Like, yeah, sure, it's good, but it's also where the planet is the most comfortable, so it could be like low-key, low-key a lot. <laughs> um, and when a planet is in detriment, it's like, uncomfortable in that sign and it's having to make it work anyway okay and you can think about um if mercury rules gemini and virgo um and it likes to be precise and analytical sagittarius is more about being expansive and seeing the big picture so that's essentially why it's in detriment there and pisces is about merging consciousnesses not delineating them right so you can see why it would be in detriment there and then what does that mean for you if you have that, right? That's what we're here to find out today. Um, having Mercury exalted, it's double. When you have Mercury in Virgo, it's like everybody step inside. We got a real smarty pants coming through. Like this is this person is chef's kiss intelligence, right? Um, but 
it also means that for those of us who have Mercury and Pisces, me, um, <laughs> it means that we are double debilitated, right? Because if a planet is in detriment or fall, it's called debilitated. If it is um, in domicile or exaltation, it's called uh, dignified, right? Again, words, phrases that are not always important for like your everyday interpretations, but if you want to have, you know, the big conversations with the people who use the words, you know, we can practice, we can do that. Anyway, 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 I have Mercury and Pisces, uh, double debilitated. Um, and we look at the rest of the chart to see like, how does that play out? Danielle says, what is exalted again? Oh, like, what does this mean? Okay, yeah. So then we get to exalted and fall. For Mercury, it, they're the same signs, but for the other planets, you can see how the other signs come into play. If a planet is exalted, um, the best explanation I saw for this is from Astro Counselor Vic, a Jyoti uh, astrologer, and he said that it's like uh, the planet is in its home office. Like, as opposed to its house, it's like where it gets work done. Like, for example, um, the sun is exalted in Aries. Like, when people with Aries suns, uh, the sun likes to do what it does in Aries. What does the sun like to do? Identify itself, be about like, this is who I am, right? And Aries, yes, that makes sense. <laughs> we, we are into that. Um, so Virgo is the exaltation sign for Mercury. And then when a planet is in fall, it means that it's working with fewer resources. So if you take that office thing, um, think about an office that doesn't have the supplies. And so for those of us who are Mercury and Pisces, not only are we, is our Mercury uncomfortable, it also doesn't have the resources. <laughs> I laugh because I'm an educator and I was like full blown all the way through school without even knowing this. Um, so again, it doesn't mean you can't do stuff. It just means you have like little systems to help you get it done. Okay. Um, and then planetary joy, uh, that's where a planet loves to be. And that's placed based on a um, traditional scheme. And the, um, there's a great PDF chapter by Chris Brennan that explains where that comes from and why. And it is fascinating. Um, and one thing I do want to mention, I saw someone say something about tropical versus sidereal. It is always interesting to see the differences between your debility, the, you can talk, the differences between your dignified placements and your so-called debilitated placements as you switch between the zodiacs. So for example, in my tropical chart, I have a dignified Taurus, a, a dignified Venus, um, and, but in my sidereal chart, it is debilitated. And it's the other way for Mercury. In my tropical chart, my Mercury is just fine. Well, it's in Aries, so I don't know if it's just fine. Um, but it's not in Pisces. But then in sidereal, then we have, um, then we have a, uh, a double debilitation, right? And what does that mean? It means that you are looking at two different arrangements of yourself. I have come to the understanding that your tropical chart may be who you are in the sheets while your sidereal chart is who you are in the streets. I have not enough evidence to confirm that, but that's what it seems like. The sidereal is really important because it has to do with what you're doing in this timeline, in the 3D. But since the tropical chart comes out of the tropics, which is like specifically the earth as it's related to the sun, it may have something to do with who you are to the earth. Things to think about, okay? Like, and also you can only know by doing comparisons and comparing hundreds and hundreds of charts. So if you're only looking at yours, that's not a data to make an informed opinion, God damn it. Okay, so someone had a question. Let me look. Uh, let me look up. Oh, what would have Mercury and Sagittarius indicate? So in and of itself, Mercury and Sagittarius would mean that this person likes to think and communicate in an expansive way. Like we like to do big picture types of things. Now in this planetary condition scheme, we're saying like Mercury likes to be a little more exacting than that. So that might be tough in real life. But you know, with yourself, it's just fine. <laughs> That's like all of these things are, right? Um, um, okay, so Alexandra says mine is in, okay, so some people, thank you for bringing this up, some people have the same placements um, throughout the zodiac. Because I was born close to the Aries ingress, 
my placements are almost the same in my draconic chart too, because that's the draconic chart is cast from um, the Aries ingress point. So um, at one point, and I think I've said this to some of you before, at one point, and this, I was talking to HP learning about this, I was like, oh, like all my placements are the same. And I thought that like, that made me like, I don't know what I thought. I, I wanted it to make me special, but they pointed out that it probably means my ancestors really needed me to get this work done. So they made it as easy as possible, as easy as possible. Like you one type of person, baby. Like you, you got one job, it's, it's all the same. Look at whatever fucking chart you want, you got one job. And now other people might not have that thing going on. I also do have stuff in my astrological chart that indicates I'm on like a karmic last chance of sorts. Like we get in towards the end of the amount of times that my bloodline has to figure this shit out since whenever they stopped figuring it out. So that makes sense to me. All the shit is the same because we have shit to do, right? Again, this is from my interpretation of my chart. This is not like, this is what it means. So I look forward to, you know, being in community with y'all and learning more about what the difference between the zodiac is because this shit is fascinating um amani says i have same mercury placements just different houses okay so when we think about signs houses aspects right think about this as you look between the zodiacs the aspects are always going to stay the same aspects stay the same that's why i focus on them because when i figured that out i said well that must be what the real astrology is because if the signs change and the houses change but the aspects never change that's that's the core right that's the important part so that's interesting right the houses are the areas of life where the issues come up and they're important to think about the transits like like what's going to happen right the signs are like the flavor or the costume that the planets are wearing to get their point across to you or the costume that you wear to get your point across to the planets right so you can just do analyses and look at the difference like especially with transits i like to think about um especially with like eclipses you can go back do like back look looking back at eclipses versus sidereal versus tropical for the houses like where the issues that came up issues that relate more to what the tropical chart is saying or the sidereal and a uh, spoiler alert you're going to find both this sh you could astrology is so fun that it will literally find ways to make sense any way you slice it there was a great explanation of this in the astrology podcast episode that chris brennan did about mercury and how mercury is the a planet associated with astrology and that its dual nature often applies to a lot of things with astrology you could do it this way or you could do it that way they both work which way is the right way they both work mm, like a prism you know it's like infinite ways to look at it um okay so <laughs> Uh, I do not remember anything about the tropical chart, and you don't have to. I do like to um, point out some of these things about analysis, though, because I, one, I used to be like, no, sidereal zodiac is the only zodiac to look at. Um, and then I realized I don't care what you look at. Like, this is what I'm looking at right now, but like, I don't care what you look at. Um, yeah, so sorry if you were one of those people before who was like, you can't talk about tropical. <laughs> that was before I understood the way my brain worked fully. And now that it's a little more um, clear, I can think through, well, what is the purpose of the different zodiacs and what can we learn from that, right? Um, and then Amanda says, relating this to music, aspects are the beat, signs are the bass line, houses are the chord progressions, melody and harmony. I really like that because let me tell you something, my sidereal chart, I was singing a way different song than my tropical chart, way different song. I really like that. And Amanda, one day we're gonna make these songs so people can see what we're talking about. I'm gonna make this song, I'm gonna make this song. All right, thank you for this, um, letting us talk about all this stuff. I really wanna make sure that I'm giving y'all as much of a baseline as possible without overdoing it. Um, so resources for today. We had the Mercury workshop work, worksheet, which is not required. Some people don't care about this. Some people like to fill out worksheets. That's for you, right? And there's also the chart directions and reference materials. This website down here, let me actually get it 
the actual website and put it in the fan chat because you can do it. There we go. I am working on putting all of my free resources, things that I use for these workshops up on one page that's not Patreon because I love using Patreon. It functions like a learning management system for me. Um, but I do understand that um, like some should be, like, they could be out, right? And that's fine. And so this is the page that um, I put them all on. So if you do not have your Mercury worksheet, if you do not have the chart directions and reference materials, and or if you're looking for the videos from the first two parties, it is there on that website. I'm calling it the Learnium because it's where you go to learn. Fun facts, fun facts. All right, so I think everybody's good on that. And we're gonna get into the book learning part. I'm gonna go relatively quickly through this, except for the cool part, but I just don't wanna talk about the tool part. Um, but we can see that Demetri George talks about the Babylonian god Nebu. I think I'm saying that right. I don't know. The Greek god um, Hermes, and then the um, Vadius Valens uh, explanation for Mercury. So one of the things I want to point out for this one is that in antiquity, Mercury was known as what's called the psychopomp, meaning um, the, the, the deity that goes between the realms, um, the only one that can go down to the underworld and then come back up okay. And so there is a um, death occult underworld association with Mercury that is often um, kind of glossed over in contemporary understandings of this planet. Um, another thing I like to look at is that uh, Mercury is associated with augurs, interpreter of dreams, temple builders, searchers of the sky. So it kind of points to Mercury's classic association with astrology in general. Um, okay, so this one, he talk, they talk about the Mercury's friends among the planets are the sun, moon, Jupiter, Venus, Uranus, and Neptune. So like a lot of them, right? But the thing that I thought was interesting is that Mars in bad aspect is the planet's worst enemy. So over and over again in these texts that I was getting prepared for y'all, what I saw is they were like, basically whatever Mercury is aspected with, it'll take on that. But if it's aspected with Mars, that person might be like kind of mad or kind of mean, right? So I'm interested today in seeing how people who have Mars aspect in Mercury is how that plays out in, in your real lives. And I would also say for Scorpio Mercury and Aries Mercury, because those are Mars ruled. Okay. Um, all right. So this one is planetary forces, alchemy and healing. And the thing I wanted to point out here is that when it comes to body parts, um, Mercury is associated with the lung, the large intestine, the nervous system, the cerebellum, the shoulder blades, the shoulders, and the hips. And this book is so interesting because it points out the physical bones in the body where um, it looks like we have wings and that's why it's the shoulder blades and that's why it's the hips, um, which I thought was really interesting. Um, we know the nervous system, but then specifically the cerebellum, which has to do with balancing and integrating the left and right. And so we're gonna get to um, some stuff here. And I'm really happy that Danielle's here because um, there's, some kundalini information that I want to get to that I hope I put in the thing, but we'll get there. Okay, so um, also they say that illnesses uh, related to mercury include stuttering, dyslexia, problems with coordination, nervous system disorders, cardiac arrhythmia, um, and respiratory problems. And this book is really, really interesting about how it talks about esoteric medical astrology. Um, yes, Tiffany says this will helpful a helpful book for the medical reads. It is very, very helpful. Um, and also it's it's a easy to read. It's a lot of text, but in sections, like mm, like less than half a page, you know, so it's it's easy on the eyes. It's, it's, I would say uh, mercury friendly, right? Okay, I did put it in here. I know this is a lot of text. Bear with me because I think it is fascinating and that we should uh, talk about it, okay? So this is a quick detour into the caduceus, and I hope that I am saying that right. 
Um, okay, so Malik says that's interesting thinking of the Kundalini and chakras. It sounds like Mercury is related to the heart and sacral, even though when I think of Mercury, I think of speech and throat, but you have to clear sacral and heart to get to the throat. Yes, okay, and in it actually may be related to all of them, to the actual like system flow. And so bear with me because I could not pick out one sentence. I said, God damn it, I'm gonna have to read it to them. This is where we are. Okay, so uh, this is Dr. Um, doc, the guy, Samuel Sagan. Um, and I don't know how to say these words, but mm, here we are. It says, let's return to the nadis or circulations of etheric energy as described by the Hindu tradition. Time out. We remember that the Hindu tradition had ties to and is connected to the Kemetic tradition. So you hear Hindu Indian, but also remember Kemetic Egyptian as well, okay? Because in the Eight Days of Lion Gate, we learned that the Caduceus is a symbol that comes from ancient Egypt. Anyway, back to this. Um, okay, as we saw when discussing the correspondences of the... You can do it, Noel. You can read them these paragraphs. Okay, I'll try again. As we saw when discussing the correspondences of the sun, the most important of all nadis is the susamna nadi, the central channel which runs from the base chakra to the top of the head. On each side of this channel run two other important nadis, ida and pingala. Just by seeing the traditional intertwined representation of these three channels, one can immediately suspect a symbolic association with Mercury's caduceus, as many Indian masters themselves like to point out. And Danielle says this is all in Kundalini Yoga, which is why I'm happy you are here today, because we are putting together astrologically, spiritually, and historically why this specific practice of what they call Kundalini Yoga is imperative for those of us who come from this tradition and those of us with afflicted mercuries anyway apart from the similarity in shape there is great meaning in the analogy the tantric tradition which is part of hinduism dealing with energy manipulations and chakra awakening relates ida nadi to the moon and the left side of the body and pingala nadi to the sun and the right side of the body the general idea with these main circulations of etheric energy is that they each induce a particular state or condition of consciousness. As we saw before, when the susumna nadi is flowing, consciousness turns into a pure awareness of the higher self. When ida flows, the tantric tradition considers that consciousness naturally internalizes, which is appropriate for mental activities or for contacting inner worlds and inspirations for tripping the fuck out, right? When it is pingala which flows, an externalization of energies and consciousness takes place, which is adequate for physical activities or anything which has to do with the external world. So we're gonna pause right there. They're saying, you got this one middle channel. You got one side that's like, shoo, 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 have dreams and shit. And then you got this other side that's like, shoo, 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 go out and like get some food and shit, right? Moving on. As Ida and Pingala have exactly opposite functions, they never flow at the same time. That makes sense. There is one simple criterion which allows you to know at any given time which of the two is flowing. When placing your hand about one inch away from your nostrils and sensing your breath, you will usually notice that the flow in one of the nostrils is greater than the other. According to tantric texts, when the left nostril predominates, it is Ida Nadi, which is flowing. That's the dream one. And when the right nostril predominates, it is Pingala Nadi. Mm, that's the active one, right? In a healthy person, there's a natural rhythm by which one Nadi flows for a certain period of time, usually about 40 minutes, followed by an equally long period of where the other Nadi is activated and so on. The associations between Ida and the moon and between Pingala and the sun fit the astrological symbolism we have described for the luminaries quite closely. The functioning of Ida is said to be cooling, refreshing, and internalizing all bodily energies, while that of Pingala is exactly the opposite. The balance between these two opposed polarities is thus the expression of the most fundamental yin-yang rhythm in the body. Just as Chinese Taoism describes the balance between yin and yang as the foundation for health, so Hindu lore considers that a proper balance between Ida and Pingala is the key for a healthy life. 
According to several Indian masters, it is in this balance which Mercury's, oh, excuse me, it is this balance which Mercury's caduceus represents, and this is why it came to be the emblem of the medical profession. So if you get in medicine that is not balancing your inga and your pingala, you're doing it wrong, right? And then also, if you're wondering, ooh, how can I live a more um, comedically inspired life? The living medical practices that have been institutionalized that you have access to include Ayurvedic medicine, Kundalini yoga, and Chinese medicine, right? That doesn't mean that you can't get this work from practitioners who are African, African American, Black in any kind of way, right? But just recognizing that these are also places that you can go, okay? Um, um, it says, even though tantric texts do not give all the details one would like to read on the precise modus operandi of these nadis, they are emphatic that every single physiological function in the body is influenced by this alternating rhythm one way or another. In particular, they consider that if either Ida or Pingala takes over and consistently flows more than the other, then the imbalance is likely to result in health disorders, okay? And you feel like, why, Noelle, are you talking about this? What does it have to do with my mercury? I would like to posit that if you have a debilitated mercury, you may have issues with the balance of Ida and Pingula, and you may need to work on regulating that yourself. How do you know that? Because I'm almost damn sure that my shit's out of balance, <laughs> right? And so I just want to offer this. Mm, this is a way more interesting way for me to do something like Kundalini kundalini yoga you explain it to me like this oh i'm in there right but you just say those words and i'm i'm not getting it but you you know you start talking about the caduceus you start talking about toth and, oh okay like i'm there right i'm so glad that people are um res this was the cool part i really wanted to get to um and now back okay. to my right um one of the things that i think is interesting about this book the inner sky is that they talk about it stephen forrest talks about the what happens if mercury is retrograde in your chart okay um i thought this was interesting to think about if you have mercury retrograde you have a mind turn inward it's free to think in independent imaginative innovative terms and it's possible a possible difficulty in self-expression and words do not form however there's something called secondary progressions where at a certain age, that mercury turns direct by progression. I don't know exactly when and how to figure that out off the top of my head. But I do know that for people who are born with retrograde mercury, at some point, all of that shifts to something else, which is also the natural progression of anything. You're born with something that you got to work at, and then you learn how to work at it. And then it's not like a problem like it was before, right? But just astrologically speaking, there is a time where that sh uh, shifts into the on position, if you will. Um, okay, so this one is from Kenneth Bowser, an introduction to Western sidereal astrology. And one thing I wanted to point out here is that he says, that when Mercury is prominently placed, the native is commonly an intellectual, a teacher, or an artisan whose superior ability lifts them above the other people. There is also a proclivity towards politics, debate, sales, office work, and civil administration when Mercury is strong. And you say, what does it mean when Mercury is strong? When you have Mercury in Virgo, when you have Mercury in Gemini, when you have Mercury in the first, seventh, tenth, fourth, houses, the angular houses, and or Mercury in strong aspect to your chart ruler. There's many other ways it could be strong, but those are some of the basics. Um, and yes, Raven, Mercury eventually stations direct through secondary progressions. Um, that is exactly what happens, and it marks a turning point in the person's life for how their Mercury is expressed. Okay, so this one is from Stephen Arroyo's Chart Interpretation Handbook. You know, when I was looking these up, I found several typos in the Mercury sections of people's books. And I was like, the trickster strikes again. No typos anywhere else, just the Mercury part. Mm, funny. Um, okay, so you can look through this to see uh, the elements of your um, sign. You know, we have the fire signs, Aries, Leo, Sagittarius. We have our earth signs, Taurus, Virgo, and Capricorn. Our water signs are going to be Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces. And our air signs are Gemini, Libra, and Aquarius. And no, I don't really have that memorized. I have to like say it and then think about it as I'm doing it. 
And you can see how elemental why elementally uh, the Mercury's function very differently. Stephen Oriel is really big on breaking people's charts down into elements and doing comparisons that way. He says that you should look at the elements of your Mercury and the element of like your parents' Mercury or like your teacher's Mercury or or like for me, for example, right? Like or your astrologer's Mercury, the people that you're dealing with communication wise and see um, what the difference is or maybe similarities and how they work together or um, not so much, right? Um, he argues for chart compatibility that Mercury's are overlooked uh, when it comes to like, is this person right for me? Romantically speaking, a lot of times people look to Venus and Mars like, oh, are we going to have good sex? Like, okay, but are you going to be able to talk about it? Like, yeah, did you think about that? No, you didn't. You didn't. And that's why I'm here to tell you. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, chart compatibility is fascinating. Um, so Malik says, Mercury deals with speech as well as thoughts. That makes sense. Thank you for that point. There's a couple other sources that get to that. And when we say communication, oftentimes we're thinking just like what I say, what I'm talking, what's coming out. It's also what's coming in, what's trapped in there, <laughs> what's under the surface a little bit. Um, yeah, it's, it's all the all the ins and outs. This book is The Inner Planets by uh, Liz Green and Howard Sasquatas. And um, we went from kind of traditional astrology to um, people writing about still traditional astrology. And this, we get into what they call psychological astrology. Now, what I am learning, uh, the people who do the traditional astrology and the people who do the psychological astrology, they don't necessarily get along. They don't necessarily see eye to eye. They seem to not appreciate the other's point of view, um, especially, I would argue, from like the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, like the beginning of the traditional movement, those people that were trying to bring back the, um, they were translating the text for the first time um, in English. Uh, and then there was this other movement about kind of like not using the traditional terms. So there's psychological astrologers who refuse to use the terms debilitated planets. They don't do any of that because they think like, what's the point of telling someone that they have a debilitated Mercury, right? But the traditional astrologers are like, but there's all these rules to find out when you will die and we have to apply the rules because we found them in the text. And if you apply the text in that point and look the point, I've calculated your date of death you know, like good for you. But then there's this side, which y'all, I feel like a little bit in the middle. I can't say I'm one or the other. Um, I like them both. But I just want to point out, this is from the other side. This is the, um, I don't want to say it's to make you feel good, but it's definitely not to make you feel bad. The traditional astrologers, especially the actual ancient ones, don't give a shit. They'd be like, you got Saturn conjunct this, you about to die from a dog bite. Like they don't care. Okay. This is like a little more holistic right so liz green tells us that the sign placement tells us how our mind works how we think learn perceive and digest experience okay uh, then they tell us that the house placement shows us an area of life where we are likely to be restless curious inventive inquisitive adaptable fluctuating cunning possibly deceitful and good at making bargains right so wherever mercury is by house that's where you like to do your mercurial things. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. I'm Mercury in the eighth house. That's where I like to be curious about. And then Mercury by aspect. To me, this is the most important one. Um, that Mercury is highly influenced and colored by the nature of any planet aspecting it, especially the planet in closest aspect. Okay, so whatever, because Mercury takes on whatever it's... Um, like or whatever it's close to so if it's mercury on mars we have a martian mind mercury and neptune we have a neptunian mind right so it's important to pay attention in addition to the sign in the house also the aspects okay hmm. now now we're getting into the good stuff i'm gonna i'm gonna get through this because we're gonna have an astrology and neurodivergence meetup another one probably um oh now we're doing this I'll figure it out one of these days, one of the Sundays that we're not doing a chart party or whatever, whatever, we'll do um, an astrology and neurodivergence meetup because um, 
you're about to get into it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So this is the part where they talk about the remediations. I love this book. Um, but I do want to point out that the Jyotish system has very specific uh, remediations for every astrological um, placement, right? Okay. Anyway, so uh, she talks about uh, Mercury, right? You can read the vibration, the needs, whatever. This is what I thought was interesting. The problematic representations of Mercury. Over-talking, huh? frequent use of social media, huh? under-talking or being painfully shy, huh? not being able to communicate, language disorders, dyslexia, lack of appropriate vocabulary for the internal experience. Oh, you mean like alexithymia? Um, being overly brash, mumbling, sore throats, that one right now, speech struggles, because I'm talking too much, not because I'm sick, um, morbid thinking, obsessive thinking, overly defensive thinking. I know this is very loud, right? Um, being verbally caustic, which is like harsh, you know, um, the, like, that's, that's how I am. Take it or leave it. Shit. Um, the inability to be verbally kind, swearing and being foul. What the fuck? And not being able to express oneself, feeling alienated. Mm, interesting. 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 Oh, that's very interesting with that number too. Right on. Anyway, so now that you're all seeing that you're having a problematic presentation of your Mercury, which could be natally, right? Like I've debilitated Mercury or it could be by transit, right? Like maybe you got Mars on your Mercury, maybe like, you know, something's going on that way. Either way, how do we remedy it, right? So I put a bunch of pages in the PDF. (laughs) I put a bunch of pages in the PDF for the remediation because one of the things she talks about is that because everybody likes to think differently, there's not just like one quick, oh, you have this, do this, right? It's like you have to find your thing, right? Um, So it says, uh, when dealing with a problematic Mercury, it is very important that the learning style and communications pattern communication patterns be honored. For some individuals, the perfect style of learning is haphazard and erratic. Another might crave silence, such as a child who prefers to learn through quiet reading, right? So regardless of whatever disability or disorder you have, the way out, the way through is through your Mercury. The same thing that debilitated you is the same thing that'll get you out, right? Isn't that always how it goes? So for example, I have Mercury in Pisces. Ah, I'm trying to write a dissertation and they're like, write it in a straight line. I'm like, no, I am the water. My brain is water. What about this, right? So what do I got to do? I got to let it, I got to let my brain do that. How do I do that with y'all? Just, I let my brain do that. And then I turn to the PhD and I'd be like, serious time. Well, now I'm on a break. But when I was doing that, that's what I did. Okay. Um, Now, the second part, this gets into my personal research. It says certain charts have a Mercury that seeks to connect while others have a mind that intends to separate and notice distinctions. At times, the modern medical model of handling intense Mercury variations is to label kids and adults with disorders such as ADD or ADHD, uh, Mercury square Uranus dyslexia, mercury conjunct the south node, learning disorders, mercury conjunct or square Saturn, um, autism, mercury and Taurus or square Neptune, um, oppositional defiant disorder, mercury opposed Mars. Now listen, I have mercury square Neptune. I know that I'm autistic, but when I read that, I cried. Um, I also knew that mercury, mercury Neptune contacts often indicate autism or autistic traits and so do moon Neptune. We'll get, we'll get into that next week. But I still cried when I saw that because I meant like, I, I thought to myself, this whole time, y'all could have just looked at where the fucking planets were on that day and been like, all these kids born this day are going to need some support. All these kids going to need some support. Okay. <laughs> and that's what I mean when I say, no, I can't diagnose you through your chart. I can do better. Not only can I tell you what's going on with your mind, I can tell you how to fix it how to make it so that it's not a problem because it's not a problem because God don't make no mistakes. You were born on that day at that time for for a reason. And it's just about finding what it is, right? And then you can also see or people are pointing out both Mercury Uranus connections and Mercury Neptune connections that you can have what they call comorbidities. Oh, it's not just ADHD or autism. It's both, right? Another, if you're looking at this and you're like, wait, no, I have it, but that's not my chart. There's other ways to get at this too, right? You could say like um, 
Mercury and Pisces, because it's Neptunian involved, has some aspects of uh, Neptune, a uh, Neptune square, right? Um, you can also say uh, Mercury in Aquarius has a bit of a ADHD vibe because of the Uranian influence, right? So I'm really glad that y'all are uh, resonating with this because this um, <laughs> yes, okay, so Mercury remediations for physical health and well-being. Okay, so this is what we do to help our bodies, especially thinking about that caduceus situation, right? Like even though, yeah, it's the mind, it's affecting our body because it affects everything. And they do say like ADHD and autism, both cognitive disability affects everything. Did you know that I found out that my um, joint pain, my uh, TM, my jaw issue, my eyesight, um, my ability to feel when I'm full, all of these things are affected by my cognitive disability, by my mercury. Also, okay, I will point out very quickly because I don't want to detour us too badly. That's why we're going to have the astrology and neurospiciness meetup. Um, but one of the things that happens in especially, especially black women and girls it's like i could i could show you the fucking research right now if you want to see a hundred fucking sources on this shit or you can just trust me they miss our diagnoses because number one the research done on the list of traits for autism um and adhd is done primarily on white male bodies and so the list isn't even formed to to how it presents in other people. Number two, a large number of the practitioners are trained by their families. I don't know how you get racist, but basically they're not looking at you to help you. They're looking at you to dismiss you and to get you out of the way. And being that happens to black people and that happens to um, female body people. And these things swirl together to create an intersectionality where you going on you going under the radar you not it's not being clocked and then you're hyper masking meaning like you're hiding everything that's wrong um to deal with it on top of it on top of it a lot of us come from a culture where these so-called autistic traits are not a fucking problem i've pointed this out before in the black church we call it call and response Mm, in the autism world, they call it echolalia. So you say something, I'm going to say it right back. Does it sound good in my head? You say it, I say it. You say it, I say it. You say it, I say it, right? And white people be like, why are you repeating me? Black people are like, I know that's right. And so no, they're not clocking it the same way and taking you to the doctor the way the, these apparently white parents are sick of their goddamn kids. Um, so I'm not saying that's what it is. That is what it seems like, okay? Because if you look at the list of how you diagnose a child, it's all things that are inconveniences to the parent. And it was very, very painful as both an autistic parent and a parent of an autistic child to go through that process um, of the diagnosis. So I'm not advocating necessarily go out there and get yourself because it's, it's painful and they hurt your feelings. I'm not saying you have to do that. And also they don't necessarily, you don't walk away with a list of solutions um but this is the this is the work right this is why we do it um, so yes i uh i recommend looking into treating the adhd symptoms however you do that because i refused to for a year and almost had to drop out of school um so yeah um malik says i'm also interested how my chart relates to having borderline personality disorder and white western hegemonic speak also thinking of how these disorders related to afro indigeneity suppression and mediumship Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, so we are going to get into it. You know that Mercury Neptune is the mark of an astrologer. They teach astrologers that if you see someone who has the aspect Mercury square, Mercury conjunct, Mercury whatever with Neptune, then that person has the ability to be an astrologer. Tell me why it's the same placement as an autistic person. And I wonder why there's not a lot of research done on this. Maybe because a lot of people who do this work don't want to admit that they are disabled and they don't want to talk about how disability is a social construct they don't want to talk about that they don't want to talk about that but that's okay we'll talk about it we'll talk about it because that's the whole point of why we do this to show us why are why are we like this and why is it good we find out right 
Um, Erica says, I only get anxious and depressed when my coping mechanisms for the ADHD are no longer functioning alignment. Yep. It took me a long time to get them to look at the whole picture, but a black female psychiatrist confirmed it for me. It was also a black psychiatrist for me. So if you need to use the um, directory, directory for therapy for black girls, the podcast is where I found the directory of black providers. And here in Arizona is where I got that done. And I, I don't, I don't know the racial demographics of anywhere, but I feel like if I got it done here, there's hope for you if you're on a more coastal place. Um, um, we are 4% of the population here. So that, that's why I say that. Um, okay, people are understanding this. Oh, and then back to the borderline personality disorder. That is a common misdiagnosis of, um, I don't know the term, but it's a common people who are not cis gendered male everybody else gets diagnosed with depression anxiety borderline personality disorder um specifically um and it if they would just do the autism like all those other things come when the autism and the adhd are not addressed also interesting they say there is a connection between untreated ADHD and the development of a narcissistic personality. So if you got some monsters in your family, some people that you're very scared of, you know, turning on the faucet the wrong way in front of, that that explains the, the bloodline of um, neurospiciness a little bit. I've also used this example many times before, but if your family has trouble getting dinner out, especially a holiday dinner, if holiday dinner is not served at the time that they said it would be served, and in addition, if you go to try to ask about it and you get yelled at, you're in a neurospicy family, okay? Um, all right, all right, all right, let me keep going. Somebody asked specifically about Mercury, Sextile, Neptune. I would argue it's all Mercury, Neptune contacts, all Mercury, Uranus contacts, and that the whether it's a sextile, square, opposition, da, 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 the squares mean like it's a problem in your life. And that's where the disorder comes from. And that's where I want to shout out to disability studies and discrit. These are the formal institutional ways to talk about these things, the theory, right? So in disability studies says that social disability is a social construct in and of ourselves. There's nothing wrong with us. A person who needs um, a mobility aid to get around, such as a wheelchair, there's nothing wrong with them. The problem comes when there's no ramp, which is the fucking institution's problem. They should be culturally responding to everybody who might come in the building, which means thinking about people who need mobility aids. And one of the ways I became very aware of this is being a parent of a small child, always with strollers. How the fuck do you expect me to get around? I got a stroller. Come on now. So I, I'm, I'm not saying I live my life needing a mobility aid. I'm saying I physically see how difficult it is to get around. And that's not because there's something wrong with the people who need mobility aids. It's because we didn't do enough work to make sure that they could get around. Okay. Phew, 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 phew. So anyway, that has to do with the, um, the social construct of disability. And then the theory of discrete combines what we call CRT, which I don't love because before the white people were like, we need a theory to talk about racism. It was just black studies. And that's what everybody fucking knew about what racism is. So whatever, I'm getting older and we have to accept that new theories come about and they are de moda and we have to talk about them. But anyway, when you combine CRT with disability studies, you get something called discrit. And this is something that Subini Abaman Ananama, oh, I'm butchering her name. Um, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to give it to you right now. Discrit. There we go. By um, David Connor, Beth Ferry, and Subini Anama. By how many times I cited these people in my dissertation, you think I could say it. But anyway, um, Erica says CRT isn't a white thing. It's a black thing from the realm of black studies designed by black scholars. That's not how it's being treated in the academy right now. And actually, I would argue that that's not necessarily true. Um, CRT very heavily indicates um, that you need to do uh, like whiteness studies. And I'm more talking about the uh, that it has a name in and of itself. 
and if we need let's actually let's back up because i don't want to say no you're wrong um because that's not that's not what i'm that's not what i'm i'm not arguing i'm just kind of argumentative and yes we'll get to y'all's mercuries uh to to like y'all this is this is this is my area of expertise allow me to explain crt comes from critical legal studies specifically in the late 1980s early 1990s there were legal scholars who were trying to figure out um or working through theoretically how racism functions in the legal system and with uh property and things of like that of that nature there were non-legal scholars who saw this going on and were like cool let's apply this to this let's apply that to that and you know the ones that got the most attention were not necessarily the ones who started it and not necessarily the ones who were doing something like it before that but then didn't call it that right so as it states as it stands right now crt has kind of left where it started from including the people who started it and the people for whom it was started for very similarly to the way intersectionality has left who it was started from for where does that come from that comes from the black feminist movement and not just kimberly crenshaw it comes from the um Combahee river collective of the late 1970s early 1980s that got together and said that black women face interlocking oppressions and because of that, the whole system needs to be thrown away, right? I'm okay, y'all. I'm really okay. I didn't know we were going to be talking about all of this today, but I guess it is my pers it's my it's my research, so this is where we are. Anyway, what I'm talking this 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 crit is these scholars took disability studies and CRT and put it together to say if you are a person who is both uh, melanated and disabled this is how the world functions for you and beyond that because the histories of racism and ableism are intertwined all of us either suffer and or benefit from this unequal system right and when you start thinking about it that way it gets really really fucking deep right think about uh terry pickens uh wrote this book called black madness mad blackness i think i'm saying it right and this is what changed this book changed my life because she taught me that one of the criteria for the slaves on the auction block was mental fitness and as such cognitive disability has always been tied to our ability to work our value as cogs in the capitalist system and that is also tied to why some of us come from cultures where we don't talk about whether we are mentally fit or not because it may prevent us from being able to provide for our families ah this shit is very very deep this is not just about oh everyone has adhd now um it's, it's not it's deeper than that okay it's it's deeper than that okay Another book, Signs of Mental Illness by Dr. Mitchell Gibson, he talks about how it's not just Mercury, it's also Saturn and Uranus. And as Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune conjoined in the late 1980s, early 1990s, there's literally a whole generation of people, um, early Gen X uh, millennial types who have this planetary combination. So when it seems like everyone has it, yeah, yeah, that's true. Anyway, thank you for coming with me on this detour. And now we're going to swing it on back to what we do for uh, mercurial remediations for emotional health and well being. Okay. Um, let's see. Hold on. Hold on. No, I'm not. Do, 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 do. Yes, it's called uh, Signs of Mental Health. So I'll write it in Signs of Mental Health. I feel like my mercury is really mercurying right now um we're out here anyway so it says mercurial remediations for emotional health and well-being what what do you do for your mercury mind right talk about your problems that's why this business is so important for me because if i don't know who would i talk to about this literally no one no one behind here has the capacity so um this and then the people in my program you know they don't want to put it all together so you know talk about it and if it's not here find your platform um writing creating happy thought structures 
writing, ridding the soul of thoughts that cause cognitive dissonance. That's interesting. Giving and receiving positive affirmation, reading, journaling, taking control of one's paradigm, connecting through social media, connecting, not overusing, right? But using it to actually find people, studying, taking a writing class, writing a manifesto to purge hard narratives and writing an integrated and holistic narrative. You got a fucked up story about your family or whatever, rewrite it. What's that Beyonce said? Something in the song bigger. Something about take the pen and rewrite it. You know what you're talking about. Do it. Just re rewrite the story. Write the story for yourself. It's all those celebrities, you know, they write their like biography and then they feel better. That one, that one, that's the song. That's the song. Okay. So thank you for coming to our third uh party in the planet party series we've been doing chart parties for over a year now but just recently we started doing planet by planet as a way to explore our charts and make sure that um we can really dial in on each one we did mars we did venus this one was mercury and next we're doing the moon i'm not sure when it's going to be um but it looks like sundays around one are going to be the time that we do these events and things of that nature a lot of the stuff we talk about with the moon is going to be uh similar to mercury because it has to do with the mind, but we're going to get into the emotions um, more. We're also going to have an astro and neurodivergence um, meetup, a support and research group. I know we talked a lot today about um, terms that you may want to explore more, and there's even more things to um, talk about in terms of how these things manifest in our lives. Uh, a reminder that neurodivergence isn't just autism and ADHD. Those ones get most of the attention, but it is a host of other conditions, and we will be sure to address um, all of those things. Um, if you want an individual session, patrons get 25% off. You can buy and book at noellastarqueen.com. Um, Thank you so much for um, sharing your charts, sharing your stories, listening to me, especially as I rant about these things that mean so much to me. Um, and I will see you all very soon. I love you and have a good rest of your night. Okay, y'all. Bye. Bye.